And welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us through the break. We're going to go ahead and go to a guest who I have actually never had on my show, but have always wanted to, been an admirer of his for a long time. And uh, I'm sure that you're wanting to hear from him now because, of course, he is running for Alabama's Senate seat to represent the great state of Alabama in the United States Senate, as he's actually already done for many years. We welcome on to the program for the very first time former Senator and Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions. Welcome to the program. Hey, Caleb. It's good to be with you in Montgomery land. Yeah, it's great to be with you. And one thing that I've actually wanted to to ask you uh, to get this thing started, uh, wh- what do I call you? Do I call you AG Sessions? Do I call you Senator Sessions, Mr. Sessions? Because you've held a lot of titles over the years. Which one do you prefer? Well, most people call me uh, Jeff, uh, that's <laughs> for sure. Um, so um, my campaign people like Senator. Yeah, well, I mean, I, it, it makes well, sense, and yeah. that's what they're pushing for, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, you Certainly, uh, Attorney General and, and uh, Senator, uh, great honors to be called that. And I did serve as Attorney General of Alabama, too. Right, and a lot of people kind of forget that, but that's that's sort of where you got your start politically. So, uh, I, sorry, I go ahead. I was in Huntington College and taught school a year in Montgomery. And so um, we watched, grew up with Montgomery Advertising and Montgomery Media down in the country land of Camden. Yeah, well, I mean, you've uh, been in the capital city quite a bit over the years. And Attorney General is actually kind of where I want to get started with you today, because uh, of course, we're going to be talking about your campaign and we, we want to get that out there. But I think that your time as Attorney General can be very informative as to your qualifications on that. And so I'd like to go ahead and start out with the first couple of questions being about your tenure as the Attorney General of the United States. And one issue that I know is at the forefront of voters' minds is, of course, border enforcement. And you have been on the front lines of this fight since before the fight was even really happening. I mean, you were the guy on the wall sounding the alarm since long before most Republicans were even talking about how big an issue this is. And and there's no question, after the Obama administration, I mean, there was an intentional dismantling of our border enforcement, and you had to come in as attorney general and do a complete 180 on that, because even in previous Democrat administrations like the Clinton administration, uh, they may not have been as hawkish on the border as you, for example, but they certainly were were not openly opposed to uh, or openly opposed to border enforcement. And so with you coming in and having to do a complete 180 on that, how did you handle that? And, and how did you really, uh, you know, make a, uh, both a statement and also the, the actual enforcement of that? Well, it was a challenge, no doubt about it. Uh, of course, one of the reasons I was such an early supporter, the first Senate supporter of Donald Trump, mm-hmm. was he made clear uh, that he was not fooling around about the border. He mm-hmm. wanted to build a wall, and he wanted to end the illegality, help us create a system that um, could America could be proud of instead of uh, this lawless system that we've had so long. And so as Attorney General, uh, we backed him uh, 100% in all those items. Most of the work, of course, is done by Border Patrol and our ICE officers who uh or part of the Homeland Security, but the Attorney General had a number of roles in it. Uh, I note, Caleb, that the ICE Officers Association, the Immigration Customs and Enforcement Officers, their police law enforcement officers, mm-hmm. endorsed me uh, um, several months ago and said I was the number, their number one supporter in all of Congress. That includes 100 senators and 435 House members. I think that's true. Over the years, I backed them. We fought to try to end the illegality, to close the loopholes. So as Attorney General, I learned even more about the loopholes and the difficulties we challenged, how we had to support our ICE officers and our Border Patrol. I declared a zero-tolerance policy, which basically was to say to our Homeland Security colleagues, we will prosecute, we at the Department of Justice will prosecute every case you bring to us. It's more than just catching somebody, releasing them on bail. Uh, they need to be held and promptly prosecuted. 
and we increased dramatically that. I doubled almost, well, more than doubled now the number of immigration judges that are part of the Department of Justice, and we advocated for legislation and policies that the president wanted to see done uh, to actually uh, begin to be more effective. So my view, Taylor, is that we have an opportunity with the re-election of President Trump, which I think is likely to happen, to be successful in closing those loopholes, to get that wall built, to back our Border Patrol and our ICE officers and end illegality substantially in this country. It's a moment of great importance. It would be historic. If, if we don't get it done now, we may never get it done. I th- I'm confident I can contribute to that, and I'm confident my opponent doesn't understand it. Well, I mean, you have been contributing to it for a number of years. Like I said, long before you were AG in the Senate, if you wanted to talk to somebody who knew about border enforcement, you went to Jeff Sessions. I mean, uh, there were there were things that, just like every other senator, you and I didn't always see eye to eye on, and that's perfectly okay. But on border enforcement, I mean, you, you were the guy in the Senate, and, and I expect that you know, there's no reason to believe that you've changed on that, especially with the work that you did as attorney general, that that would absolutely be true. And I think people sometimes forget, and I'd like for you to speak on this a little bit as well, uh, how important that law enforcement side of it is, because a lot of what was going on in the Obama administration was they were rounding people up and they were processing them, but they were also saying, okay, well, we're just going to basically take your word on it and you have to be back before a judge at this date and one of the things that you just talked about was increasing the level of judges. And, and the thing is, the left is trying to pivot the conversation on this to people that are uh, refugees or, or people that have a legitimate sanctuary claim. Well, the increasing of things like judges and the administrative stuff that your administration did, that actually helps those people. Well, that's right, Caleb. Uh, these are... Uh... Let me tell you what's been happening. It, it's um, even under the Obama administration, many of the judges were appointed by their administration. But eighty-five mm-hmm. percent of the asylum claims were denied, uh, and uh, these are not legitimate asylum claims. Mm-hmm. There's no basis for somebody in Mexico to claim that they they can't live in Mexico. Well, there's a gang nearby. Well, there's a, Mexico is a big country. You don't have to, you don't get the right to demand you want to go to Belgium because uh, there's a drug gang in your neighborhood. Right. You move to place else in, in Mexico. I mean, this is what the law is. And uh, so they were pouring across the border, uh, would be apprehended. Actually, they will turn themselves into the uh, Border Patrol people. Mm-hmm. They will then be released on bail, catch and release. That's what it is. They're asked to come back to a hearing, and many of them don't. And those that do, you know what happens to them? Let's say they're part of the 85% that gets denied. Right. Then uh, they're released on bail again and ter- told to come back to a certain date so they can be deported. Well, then they got a free shot at the apple. They get asylum or they don't. And then if they don't, they just stay in unlawfully. Uh, it is, it's a cl- horrible thing, and it's just a mockery of law, and it's an embarrassment to a great nation like the United States. We have borders. Our Constitution doesn't apply in Mexico, and theirs right. doesn't apply in the United States. To admit it, be admitted to our country, you have to ask for permission. You have to have a permission to, to enter, and we have mechanisms for that, and millions cross the border every day. But the people who are illegal, many of them have criminal records, uh, come across the border unlawfully and try to get away with it. So I just, to me, it goes against everything I was raised with as a good Alabama, uh, you know, just person. You follow the rules. You wait your turn. Uh, we admit 1.1 million to permanent legal residents every year. We're an exceedingly generous nation. Uh, we cannot con- continue to tolerate this illegality. Well, and I think that's what it really boils down to. And the reason that this message has hit a nerve with people and, and in large part, not the only reason, but in large part wound up being sort of the main reason that Donald Trump got elected 
specifically goes back to the idea that American citizens, whether they're on the right or the left or where their political leanings are, they're looking at this system and they're saying, well, now, wait a second. If I had a, you know, some kind of traffic violation, the government wouldn't be nearly as soft handed with me, especially when you're talking about the very crime that they are committing. You're releasing them knowing that they're going to continue committing that crime, at least with the traffic violation. If you just let somebody off, there is at least a hope that maybe they won't commit that violation again. They're being released specifically to continue to violate the law, and, and the judges were doing that knowing that, and I think that's the reason that uh, really the, the average citizen looked at that and said, well, why is the, the government treating the non-citizen better than the citizen? I, I really do think that's the reason that it resonated. I, yeah, let me just say one more thing about it. It's so important. Uh, there is on, in the Democratic Party, and maybe some, there's some softies in the Republican Party, you want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. The battles I fought, the three big battles over amnesty, and one each time, uh, always had a Democrat or Republican support. The first one involved President Bush supported it. Mm -hmm. John McCain and all that crowd, uh, and then it's come back twice each time and have been able to defeat it. But I led the fight all three times. Uh, we mastered the details. We were able to expose the flaws in the bill and why it would not work and why it guaranteed amnesty but would not produce it, uh, lawfulness in the system. More people would come illegally expecting themselves to get amnesty too. But I wanted to mention this. The left is totally open borders. This is an unthinkable, radical policy. The Absolutely. bill that the Democrats just passed in the House provided this governmental relief money to illegal aliens. Yep. Give me a break. I mean, the first thing you do to stop illegal uh, immigration into America is stop sending them checks. I mean, wh what kind of message does that send? And then you have the deal that somebody breaks into the country unlawfully, goes into Houston, or not Houston, but uh, let's say Los Angeles or San Francisco, commits a serious crime, mm -hmm. and they provide sanctuary to them. They will not let an illegal immigrant who is, who is subject to being deported immediately, who then commits another criminal off offense, be turned over to the ICE officers so they can be deported. It's just unthinkable. So I think politically, Caleb, Mm. We need to make sure every American knows this is the only way it's going to be settled, and that's with public opinion. They need to know just how radical the democratic policies are, that it's unsustainable. And the only theory behind it is anybody that breaks into the country unlawfully uh, is entitled to stay here forever and receive all the welfare benefits that Americans get. It's just an unthinkable, uh, unjustifiable policy. And it's got to be fought against, both publicly and substantively. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think any time that you start treating the non-citizen, that you start extending to them more rights than the citizen has, then you've obviously messed up your priorities as a country. But I want to pivot real quickly. Uh, one more thing before we leave your, your time at the Attorney General's office. Uh when that was going on, your DOJ had to do another complete 180, not only on border enforcement, but also on matters regarding religious liberty. And that's something that I'm really concerned with as a minister myself. I know that that's something that is incredibly important to the people of Alabama, being a state right here in the Bible Belt. And uh, you had to really, I mean, completely turn the uh, how the DOJ stance was on some cases and, and where they were for some and then against some. Uh, when it came to your administration having to come in and, and completely change that. And so uh, give us some details on that and maybe mention a couple of cases that your Department of Justice was, was working on then. Well, thank you, Caleb. Uh, this is an unappreciated thing. Americans by the millions, church-going people by millions, were horrified at the hostility that the federal government was beginning to display over a growing number of years against people of faith and their ability to exercise their faith. For example, the Little Sisters of the Poor did not want to uh, provide money for an abortion pill. They, it was against their faith, and they refused to do it. And they were ordered to by the uh, 
administration, the Obama administration, and they filed a lawsuit to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And the Obama administration fought them every step of the way. But we reevaluated that case when I became attorney general. We believe that was clearly within their constitutional right to uh, freely exercise their religion. In the Constitution, the First Amendment provides every American the right to free exercise of their religion. Uh, we believe that they, they should be able to, they should be left alone. We, we stopped that, we, we settled that lawsuit. We acknowledged they were correct, even had to pay them some attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. And that another big deal was the, the baker, the cake baker, Jack Phillips in Colorado, who re, did not believe and did not, it, he felt strongly that he should not be forced to participate in a wedding he didn't believe in. Right. Against his faith, and he would not do it. And so the full power of the state came down on him, and he went all the way to the Supreme Court. And we flipped sides on that, and we joined with Jack Phillips, uh, and won in the Supreme Court that he could he could not be made to do that. And then you had a case in in California. The radicals there said that a pro life uh, center had to put up a sign saying where you could go to get an abortion. And they said, this is making us speak. You are forcing us to speak against what we believe. Mm -hmm. And we're not putting the sign in our, our abortion, uh, pro-life center. And we joined with them uh, in, in their lawsuit and won that. We also wrote a policy, uh, that a detailed policy to contain some of the secular forces in our federal government from harassing church people, and it received a great deal of support in the Christian legal community. Uh, it represented a sea change in some of the things that were happening. So I am proud of that. I'm glad you mentioned that, Caleb. Well, uh, I, I do think the way you started that out is correct, is that it's underappreciated. I'm, I'm sorry, repeat that. You were breaking up a little bit. I uh, said, so, yeah, thank you, and uh, a lot of people probably did not know uh, that how strong a stand we took on that and the fact that we uh, were successful. It was a major change. Well, it's, it's one of the issues that I know my audience absolutely resonates with, and, and I do think that it's important to the people of Alabama. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to talk to you about, because uh, you and, and President Trump and, and your relationship with him uh, this is my perception, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. This is just how I analyzed it. So, you know, I'm, I'm an outsider looking in. I'd, I'd like to get your take on this. Uh, the way that I always told people about the somewhat turbulent relationship you sometimes had with, with President Trump was that even though you guys agree on 90% of the issues, I would say, I think where a lot of the, the personality clashes come from is that President Trump, it, though he may be a law and order kind of guy, he's not really much of a rule by the book follower, and, and you're the exact opposite of that, which is exactly what you want in an attorney general, and it's a good quality to have in an attorney general. But you know, President Trump, at least, again, this is my perception of him, you actually know the man, so I want you to tell me if I'm wrong. He, he's kind of a, just get it done, even if you have to fudge the rules a little bit, and you're a by the book guy. Do, do you think that's a fair analysis and might explain some of the reasons that you, that you had some, you know, personal differences on how to handle some things? <laughs> well, maybe uh, a little bit, but I am a big believer uh, in its important constitutionally mm -hmm. and what scholars refer to as the unified executive. Uh, the, the president is the, is the source of all executive power. He is right. the center of all executive power, and all of his cabinet members should serve the president and help him achieve his goals. And the attorney general, uh, as attorney general, the things we've mentioned, the immigration and uh, religious freedom, they were all supported by President Trump. Our crime policies, our cutting regulations, our uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of other policies. So we, we believe in supporting that. If the president wanted to achieve something, our lawyers would try to help him figure out a way to do it lawfully, and, and so it becomes, in fact, law and doesn't get blocked by some court. So, yeah, we did have that single disagreement over recusal. Uh, sure. The law was clear, and I felt uh, and then it just mandated, and it's you know, shown out, 
today. Uh, I, uh, not only was I an official in his campaign, I don't think there was any other public uh, elected public official in America that had a title in the campaign. I was national security uh, chairman mm-hmm. of the National Security Committee, which some of these complaints dealt with, Russia dealt with. They accused me of wrongdoing. They, uh, I was a witness to some of the things that uh, happened. So not, I was a witness, I was accused, and I was the, uh, an official in the campaign, and the law of the department was clear uh, that you can't investigate yourself. Right, and that, there's one thing... Me and our campaign, the things that we did mm-hmm. together, and um, but but so it was so painful and so frustrating for him. I, I I mean, this man is so strong. He's been gifted with strengths that I'm not seeing in other people, and he does not um, take frustrations lightly, and sure. he keeps pushing. And it's just one of those things that we were not able to. Uh, Accord, but I, it did. The matter finally got cleared up. He was uh, absolutely exonerated. Nobody even mentions Russia now, and uh, we're on the uh, we're on the way to seeing him reelected. And uh, he'll, he'll certainly have Alabama support and my support uh, and my support in the Senate if I return. Well, and that's one thing that a lot of the people, because I've talked to a lot of voters about this, and there there are two main criticisms of you as a candidate. And that, of course, is one of them. They, they say that you shouldn't recuse. I, I've said for a long time that uh, based on what we know now, if you had not recused, you would have actually been in violation of not one, but actually two federal laws. And we learned that especially after the Mueller report actually came out. I don't know if you just weren't able to talk about it before then or, or what, but when that came out, we found out actually you were the target of the investigation and found out, what was it, just two or three days before you announced your, your, your recusal that you were actually a target of that investigation and because of that you had to recuse. And that was something we didn't know really until the Mueller report came out and, and that really helped shed some light on your decision. Well, yeah, and that's true. And um, it's just, um, th- th- that's the way it, it happened. And as um, I was briefed on the matter, and, uh, you know, it was clear to me that the clear statute required me to uh, not supervise the investigation of which I was subject and, and a witness and, uh, and a part of the campaign. Fundamentally, you cannot investigate a ca- campaign mm-hmm. that you have a role in, and I had a role in it. So just day one, uh, that was uh, out there. So, yes, um, I'm glad it looks like this is finally over. I'm totally supportive of Attorney General Barr. Uh, he's uh, getting to the bottom of it. Uh, I really believe that that's important. I do not believe this matter can end until the American people know how it all happened. And I think it's uh, the best way to save and reform and strengthen the FBI and the Department of Justice is to get to the bottom of it. Whatever wrongdoing people are punished for, it's all brought out so the public sees it. Only then can you really reform an agency. It'll never be effective if you don't find out what the truth is. So I I do think that he's doing the right thing there for sure. We want to see the Department of Justice uh, rise to the highest possible level uh, where there's discipline within it, and you don't have people like um, Jim Comey. I I think he set a really bad tone. I I worried about it from what I knew about him before I became Attorney General. I, I never thought he should be kept. The president was wrongly criticized for making the final decision to remove him uh, uh, several months later. But uh, there was ample justification for it, and what we've seen Oh, in retrospect, I think you should have got rid of Comey like the second day he was in office. Well, that was my view, and um, I had done some background on it and a number of different things that caused me great concern. Uh, They were leaking like a sieve. Uh, they were um, uh, violating rules and procedures. He'd become arrogant, didn't think the rules replied to him. And as the months go by, that became even more clear that what I concluded before I became attorney general 
and the investigation of Flynn and sending those wit- those investigators in, that occurred before I became mm-hmm. attorney general. I didn't know about that at, at the time, of course. Right. And But we'd already seen too much. And, and what we've seen since, like taking notes of a meeting with the president of the United States and then leaking those notes to a mm-hmm. friend deliberately uh, is unthinkable for a disciplined, r- responsible FBI director. It's just unthinkable to me. And he had a political agenda when he did it. So I, I just, you know, so sorry to get fired up on that one. But no, I, I understand. And no, I got to say... That it's got to be fixed. Yeah, and, and personally, I've got to say this from, from my own perspective. I owe Michael Flynn an apology because with everything that, that we knew coming out and the information that we had at the time, I really thought that he was, was one of the bad actors and that President Trump had, had brought him in, uh, in in a way that I thought was incorrect and he just made a bad call on that one. Uh, but, but I got to say the more that we found out the the more that we have learned about this thing as it goes on, it appears as though, uh, Michael Flynn and, and the allegations against him were made out of complete whole cloth. And, and that's surprising to me because I was on the other side of this argument when this debate was going on. And so I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit to that and, and maybe how your successor, uh, William Barr has handled that. Um, why is this? an issue that is so incredibly important to the the American people to make sure that justice is served here? Look, um, I don't know all the things that went on there, uh, even to this day. I don't, I just don't have it. Sure. But what I know is that what, what they did was wrong in taking, unmasking these, uh, these uh, ta- tapes or intercepts uh, that Flynn was involved in, uh, that's improper unless you have a national security reason for it. Sure. And most of these people did, and what, 38 people did? Why in the world uh, was Joe Biden in the last few days of his tenure in the White House as vice president, why was he uh, asking for these uh, intercepts mm-hmm. from Flynn? There was no national security basis for it, and the same with 37 others, probably, that were involved in it. So I, I think mm-hmm. that was important. Secondly, uh, it looks like the president was, Obama was present, uh, was v- possessing the very documents. He'd studied them. He shocked Deputy Attorney General at the time, his deputy, uh, Sally Yates, by knowing so much about these tapes. She was shocked uh, about it. And the next thing you know, that an investigation of Flynn that was to be closed uh, was kept open because the president personally met with Yates and with uh, Comey, mm-hmm. and, and they discussed Flynn. And the president, if you remember, Caleb, one bit of advice he gave to Trump was to not hire Flynn. And there was no doubt about it that um, Flynn was not on the inside with the now, Obama theory of international relations and President Trump liked Flynn, and he, that's who he wanted as mm-hmm. his national security advisor. He gets to pick his national security advisor, not Barack Obama or Joe Biden or, or Jim Comey. Right, in so the they, same way that President Bush doesn't get to pick President that, Obama's national security advisor. Repeat that. I said in the same way that President Bush doesn't get to pick Barack Obama's national security advisor. That's not something the previous president gets to decide. Right. We need to accommodate to the fact that the president, who's elected by the people to carry out an agenda, and national security is his agenda, and uh, he needs to be able to pick his aides as he thinks will help him achieve what he believes is right for America. So, yeah, that was a... Um, a big deal there, and uh, it, the, what they did to him by sending them in, I think, is fairly called a setup. I think they set him up. They should have called the White House counsel like they always do before they inter- interview a top official. They never gave uh, President Trump any warning that uh, if they thought 
uh, Flynn was bad, they should have warned the president. They never did that. Uh, they were determined to get Flynn and maybe go from there. So it was not a healthy thing. Uh, there were leaks everywhere, totally improper leaks. Uh, these uh, unmaskings, they were leaked regularly. A plain crime. I hope they figured out who leaked some of this stuff and some people go to jail for that. So that's the kind of thing that uh, I believe we're moving past. Uh, we've got a good uh, team uh, now the president has and that mm -hmm. I think will show discipline and help him achieve uh, the agenda for which he was elected. Well, I, I do certainly hope that comes to, to pass. And, and you may remember I, I told you uh, a couple minutes ago that there are two primary criticisms that I hear about you as a candidate. And the first was, the, of course, the whole matter with your recusal. I'd like for you real quickly to address the second one, which is uh, there are a lot of people that, that don't necessarily hold that against you. Uh, people that even in my own family that, that still like you think that you're a, a fantastic former senator and attorney general, but at the same time, they think that they should go with somebody younger, somebody that hasn't been in Washington for you know multiple decades like you have. And so I'd, I'd like for you to just speak to that for a moment. Well, thanks, Caleb. Uh, look, um, if I had gone soft it, as your senator, if I had... Uh, let the politically correct crowd tell me what to do, the Washington Post and CNN and all that crowd. If I'd been uh, captive by the big business, the Zuckerbergs in the Silicon Valley and Wall Street, uh, if I hadn't defended our values uh, on a regular basis, whether it's lawful system of immigration, they raised a billion dollars mm -hmm. in the last battle over immigration. Every lobbyist in Washington was bought. Who was the number one fighter? Me. Uh, and the same with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that trade agreement. Uh, I led the fight on that. We only had five no votes. The first vote, five out of 100 senators, and Senator Shelby and uh, Rand Paul and Ted Cruz and Susan Collins and I. That's who it was. That, that's a uh, weird thing to throw so Susan Collins in there. I didn't know that she was one of the votes. No, I, well, she's a Mainer, and Maine, I uh, believe, has always had a tradition of, of defending American manufacturing hmm. against unfair trade. But, uh, look, that's the way it w was. So I led that fight, and then I led the fight to uh, on support Trump. Uh, but, look, I'll say this about my opponent, okay? Okay. He knows nothing. He brags about knowing nothing, but uh, he's not a spring chicken himself. He's 65. And he's going to walk in there. He's never made a political speech in, my, in his life prior to this announcement, I think. Uh, he gave not a dime to Donald Trump. He never said a kind word about Donald Trump. He never uh, endorsed Donald Trump. Uh, and any other Republican or conservative, to my understanding. And so, uh, look, when, it, when you hit the uh, floor of the United States Senate, and we're having to fight for and debate for against Schumer and against Bernie Sanders and against Elizabeth Warren. I know how to do it. I've been doing it. I have done it. I know those people. I know how they operate. I have not sold out the values of the people of Alabama. I'm the same person I was before, and uh, I'll be the uh, – look, it's just – it would be – it's more than just casting a vote, you know? Sure. Going to say, well, I'm going to vote for the wall. Okay, well, how do you fight for the wall? How do you get votes? You don't just sit down with somebody and, and, and smooth them. You really need to move public opinion. You need to show the loopholes and, and weaknesses and necessity of this. Advocate it. Go on television. Make speeches. One year, I think 14 of 2015, I spoke more on the floor of the Senate than any other senator. You don't need a potted plant in Washington. You need somebody who will stand up and fight for what we believe in and not embarrass us by making silly things, saying silly things. So I, I, I feel like at this point in time, I'm ready. I feel good. I know what the issues are. We'll have tremendous possibilities to reset our relationship with China. I know a lot about that. Tommy Tuberville has been very weak on that. Oh, he, he said the president's wrong to stand up to China some months ago, and 
and he said that uh, we can't do anything about China now. No, no, no. Now's the time. Now is the momentum time for the whole world, and it's happening. What I've been saying for weeks is happening. Australia, African nations, European nations are beginning to push back against China for the first time because they're such a totalitarian, communist, atheistic government, and they're not like Canada. And you have to treat them much, much differently. And we have to defend our interest and protect our American manufacturing and our medical supplies and those kind of things. So we're, I believe that there's an opportunity here uh, to get some great things done, and I'm not sure my opponent's ready for the fight. Well, my, my last question that I want to get to before we move on uh, today is actually along the same lines. You did a perfect segue into it because we're talking about Chinese things, so let's talk about the coronavirus. Uh, with your what the Senate is doing right now, and of course you know that the House just passed a $3 trillion bill that now goes to the Senate, uh, how would you rate the Senate's handling of this so far with the uh, initial stimulus package, with the, the package that they're doing now that looks like it's going to be dead on arrival? How would you rate Mitch McConnell and the other Senate Republicans, and, and would you follow suit, or there's things that you would do differently? Just speak to that to us for just a moment. Are you talking about not China, but the uh, basic relief bill? That- right. Basically, the legislation that, that the Senate has done in response to that. Would you have handled it differently? Do you think they're doing a pretty good job? Where, where do you stand on that? Well, it was a, a catastrophe, a total national emergency, um, and uh, we've never seen anything like such a dramatic impact on the American economy and jobs. And so I supported uh, the general concept. Uh, I was proud that the Republicans, more than they usually do, exposed the Democrat left-wing agenda that they tried to tack on to the bill. You get a bill like that that really needs to pass, it needs to pass soon. American people are in need of it immediately, and they start demanding we won't pass it unless you have vote by mail, and if you do all these other liberal things. Yeah, funding for Planned Parenthood. Yeah, fight back, but it wasn't perfect. But they, uh, there are some things I didn't like. I uh, like. Do you, do you know that a government employee making less than seventy five thousand dollars a year, not about to lose their job, got the twelve hundred dollar check. Right. Um, and uh, there wasn't sufficient control over keeping it from going to illegal aliens. There are all kinds of problems out there that uh, that speed probably made it hard to do. But now we have some more time. This next bill cannot be the one that's, uh, that Nancy Pelosi moved out of the House. This one cannot pass uh, the way it is. For example, it has money for illegal aliens. Right. It's just full of things like that that's got to be stopped. All right. Well, let's say that there is somebody that has has heard what you've been saying. They like what they hear. They want to support you. They want to learn more about you as a candidate. Where would they go to do that? JeffSessions.com the the, the right place to go. Um, I think you and we're trying to and are in fact uh, being um, thoughtful and aggressive and laying out on our Facebook and uh, sites and Twitter my views on important issues like China and how it's all developing. So we'd like for people to know that um, my views are Alabamians' views. I grew up in this state. I didn't just pass through. I grew up here. For 18 years, I went to every county in this state every year. Uh, I educated here. My family goes back uh, generations, all of them. All my grandparents were here Mm -hmm. over 100 years. 50 years ago. And so I just would say, I I think I know our values. They're my values. I know my people in Alabama. Uh, I I just think that we can make some real progress in the next uh, few years, helping President Trump, who's advocating our values. And let's go get them. I'm ready. All right, Senator. Well, thank you so much for being generous with your time and speaking to us. We appreciate it and certainly do wish you the best. Thank you, Caleb. Nice to talk to you.
Yes, sir. Good to talk to you as well. That is, of course, Senator Jeff Sessions, a former senator and now running back for his same seat that he originally held and then moved on, of course, to become the Attorney General of the United States. We thank him so much for being here on the program with us, and, and hopefully you've found this informative. We will be back in just a minute. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break, and we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you. <laughs> 